So you have The Lion King being one of Disney's best films ever made. And then you have The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, being one of the most worthy straight-to-video sequels ever made. What could possibly be continued after this? What would the next entry be? Simple. Let's go back to the first, but make it center on Timon and Pumbaa and see what shenanigans unfolds during the set first. That idea proposed by Disney executives brings us the oddball edition, The Lion King 1.5, or in other countries, The Lion King 3, Hakuna Matata. Let's not beat around the bush here. Even by the standards of Disney sequels, this is one of the strangest entries I've ever watched. It's oddly thought of, it's oddly written, it's oddly numbered. I mean, one and a half? I know that some Disney sequels took place in the middle of the original counterparts, but at least to my knowledge, I have never seen a title like this before. Well, except for Naked Gun 33 and 1 3rd and the many oddball Kingdom Heart titles. But with The Lion King being titled the one and a half, it was such an alienated concept when I first discovered it. I just had to check it out. As I talk about this movie, I'm going to be taking a different approach, as it is quite the... uniqueness. The first two had a pattern. Theme, characters, songs, and an epilogue of sharing my personal background behind them. This is all going to be there, but the movie itself has moments that dramatically change course. A breath of fresh air as it's a challenge I'm willing to live up to. So sit back and relax as we are once again returning to Pride Rock. So looking back on this movie, it was all over the place. I wouldn't say that's because it wasn't well received. Quite the opposite, actually. Watch Mojo listed this at the number one spot for the most worthy Disney sequel, and Rotten Tomatoes displayed this movie at a positive rating for both critics and the audience. But given the reputation of both of these, that can only be taken with a pinch of salt. There are those who I have interacted and stated that this was more of a cash-in and an inferior entry, but there are issues I too had with them. There are also moments in the film that I adored as well. So, in actuality, not only was the reception polarizing, but my thoughts in the movie were also polarizing. There were times when I stated the movie as hilarious, but at other times, I was on a hate wagon for it. But the overall reason why it has become so indecisive for me over the years is simply because it was the least amount of times I've watched it compared to the first two entries. I didn't watch it enough to form my own thoughts, and this is why I'm happy to finally talk about it and bring closure once and for all. So, what is this movie about? Firstly, it takes place before the original story, as Timon is the primary focus. As before, the cast has the returning roles. Nathan Lane, Ernie Sabella, Matthew Broderick, Moira Kelly, Whoopi Goldberg, Robert Guillaume, you get the drill. As the previous entries had more serious topics, this one by no surprise consists of more comedy. The themes I can dig up from this involve being in the footsteps of a reject, stepping out of your comfort zone to explore new territory, and understanding the importance of your close colleagues and their circumstances. A lot of these do seem very specific to Timon's character, but Pumbaa has a share of this as well. Until I get to him though, the most that I can take from this is that I feel this movie wants to make up for the lack of Timon's backstory mentioned in the original during Hakuna Matata. During that song, we only heard about Pumbaa. Where Timon was, however, was a question yet to be answered. When I was a young meerkat. When he was a young meerkat. Very nice. Thanks. It's not necessarily integral to the original, but it is nice to have. Up until then, his character was only reliable on his personality. One of the biggest complaints I hear about Timon is how selfish he is. Most of this is proven back when he took credit from Pumbaa raising Simba in the original, and again in The Lion King 2 when he was suggested that Kovu helps out against the birds blocking the bug nest. But I never really took issue with these moments because of how oblivious Timon was being. They came off as unintentional, as if Timon wasn't listening in the first place. Here though, they make it obvious that he's being selfish. He hogs a bigger nest that was for Pumbaa when sleeping in the water hole, he uses Pumbaa as a tool for defense, and even dismisses Simba for leaving despite his dire circumstances. His realization is played up near the end of the film after all this, but that's obviously no shock at all. Aside from the moments where he gives his apologies to Pumbaa, his backstory does a decent job at explaining why he's written like this. He lived with other meerkats and was a klutz at ruining Tuttles. He's looked down on for being a troublemaker for them. He not only fails to contribute, but even fails to surveillance any oncoming hyenas. This is even more emphasized by one of two additional characters, Uncle Max, voiced by Jerry Stiller. His character is nothing more than what's presented to the rest of the meerkats who are hell-bent on surviving and digging tunnels. Unfortunately, he doesn't bring much else after the story other than knee-jerk reactions. That would be... 
Team Wall, the Sentry? Why don't you save the hyenas the trouble and kill me now? Just kill me now! Are you nuts? He's wearing a dress! He can be funny, but I wish he was more useful in the story. The second character who is more active is Timon's mother, voiced by Marge Simpson herself, Julie Kavner. Unlike the rest of the group, Timon's mother has the obvious care and support like any other mother would. She tries everything to keep Timon active and fitting in the rest of the group while trying to give him a reality check that this is how he's supposed to live. And while she is challenged at his expense, her sense of care shines on what's best for him. Even at the most corner end, she is willing to let him explore and go out on his own. But even that comes to a point where she goes to find her son. But that does benefit the final act. Based on all the aforementioned, he doesn't want to dig to survive. He wants to live happily without having to worry about anything. And because of how badly he's looked down on, he only has himself to care for on top of having the instinct to survive. This is not only something that people can relate to, but this arguably justifies his actions that would later challenge him in the movie. Unfortunately for any characters I did take issue with, it was the hyenas. While I found them more entertaining in the first movie, this trio here was devolved into a series of food puns. I get that they made a few when Simba first encountered them, but after that, they barely made any puns and spoke normally with Scar. But here, we get lines like, this is dinner and a show. And I thought beans were the only musical food. <laughs> I say we skip the wedding and go straight to the buffet. And that's just how I like them. <laughs> Scramble. <laughs> and a little bit runny. For your last meal, you're gonna eat those words. Yeah, this was literally their entire dialogue over their small screen time. And I'm more than certain that they had more creative dialogue than that. To the credit, Whoopi Goldberg and the rest of the cast for the hyenas were just fine in their performances, and it's nice that they got their chance to reprise their roles. I just didn't like how watered down they were written. They were much funnier in the first movie. Midway in is basically Timon and Pumbaa interacting with what happens during the first half of the original film, most of which feels a bit fan service, while others are slight humorous jabs that apply at how the moments happen. More of a parody itself when you think about it. From here on, they go out with all kinds of humor as it's the selling point of the film. Slapstick humor, awkward humor, gross out humor, fourth wall humor, and of course, toilet humor. But there are some moments that are genuine and worth the time to watch. This is where the review shifts away from the usual as the moments are to be addressed more in contrast to the characters and the narrative. Having the characters tell the story in the structure of Mystery Science Theater 3000 is the start of it. Compared to the first two entries where the opening sequences were pure atmosphere and no dialogue, this silly conversation between these two in a theater is a welcomingly different take. It lets you know what you're in for as they indulge themselves. However, this eventually becomes an issue as periodically the scenes come to a pause. What's worse is that for the sake of attempting humor, they happen at the most intense moments, whether it was a chase, rescuing Simba, or going down a waterfall. I get that's the idea, but I personally do not like having tension stripped away completely at the expense of a pause. It's annoying. Super annoying. Also, I didn't like that Timon was picking his nose during one of the set pause moments. I, I didn't find that funny at all. This would be the first of what I developed a hatred for to this movie over the years. As far as the moments interacting with the first half goes, I got chuckles, but I never really laughed out loud. The most that I chuckled at was when they were walking across the field at the iconic shot of the rising sun. Others were when Timon was the one responsible for the tumbling animals at the end of I Just Can't Wait to Be King, and when he and Pumbaa attempted to sabotage Simba's time with Nala much later in the film. The rest of the first half goes by quickly as Timon encounters the many places that we remember. The waterhole, the elephant graveyard, when Scar performs Be Prepared, and the wildebeest stampede. He gets so desperate looking for the perfect home that he assumes he's found one at every step of the way. Not only does this get repetitive, but it felt uncomfortable. But the worst out of all this is something that I was saving for since I reviewed the first movie. Upon meeting and befriending Pumbaa, he unveils an issue that Timon claims as a special power. During the Circle of Life ceremony, Timon attempts to walk through the herd to reach the waterhole quicker. Pumbaa, however, has an issue with large crowds to where during his struggle in making a cross, he unveils his special power. the royal sun. Yeah, Pumbaa's special power is a massive fart. 
I said before that I take issue when a fart is played out on a Disney movie, but that's mainly because I hold Disney films at a higher standard, even with the sequels. But not only did this fart joke happen here, it affects the perspective of the ceremony itself. Applying the fact that Timon is the one responsible for the animal tumble in the ending of I Just Can't Wait to Be King, I had to process the fact that Simba was bowed to not out of respect for a future king, but rather at the expense of a massive fart. I don't know if that was meant to be spiteful or not, but it sure feels like it. This is another major reason why I was on that short hate wagon. But these moments, I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt as the later fart jokes were actually done better. During the final act, after Timon and Pumbaa distracted the hyenas with the hula dance, they lured them into a cave as Pumbaa lets out an explosive fart scaring them away. It plays out like a bomb, and it happened so fast that I actually did get a good chuckle. Another of which was when he, Timon, and Simba are in a jacuzzi-like lake, only to reveal that it was Pumbaa making it happen. It's more of an awkward joke than it was as a potty joke. Aside from being aware of it, this moment and the cape bomb scene works better because of how unexpected they are. That wasn't the case when Pumbaa let out his fart during the Circle of Life ceremony. The scene built up on it way too much by having Pumbaa prevent it from happening as much as possible. And as a result, it was sorely predictable that I just rolled my eyes. Despite how much of an issue I took with this moment, none of this devalues Pumbaa's character. As expected, he plays up a role in being the voice of reason to keep Timon's morality in check. As his backstory was demonstrated in the first movie, Pumbaa is a lonesome warthog at the expense of his... special power. But because of his loneliness, it gets Timon to think outside of his selfish ego and develop a friendship between the two. Truth is, I'm all alone too. Pumbaa. You're the only friend I've ever had. You mean? Yeah, Pumba. And friends stick together to the end. Even before that point, Timon continues to keep Pumba around even when it almost comes off as being dismissive. It's a friendship that develops within time, and rewardingly, a moment like this comes off as genuine and sincere. And speaking of sincerity, the best moments in this movie picks up when they find and raise Simba. Unlike the first movie, young Simba is voiced by a different child actor. Rather obvious, since Jonathan Taylor Thomas would be in his 20s at the time. Here we have Matt Weinberg, who has taken minor roles in a handful of movies. The first X-Men, The Last Dance, The Bench Warmers, just to name a few. And he took a bigger role in a horror comedy flick, Spooky House. His acting in this one is a lot more over the top, where Simba felt like a different character. I didn't necessarily take issue with it, though, since he is living in a different and carefree lifestyle. And we do have a moment where Timon genuinely helps Simba out when he had a nightmare one night. I can only imagine what that said nightmare would be. But regardless, I loved this moment deeply. It hints the viewer on what Timon has potential of when learning to set aside his own ego for the sake of helping others. Struggling to keep Simba's childhood maintained and even challenging him in his later years. This was another step for him. In addition, we see a brief interaction with Simba in his teen years as he competes Timon in a snail eating contest. This moment is both hilarious and pretty disgusting. They get snail slime all over their lips, all over their faces, and they get fatter and more sick from consuming so many of them. It's a pretty intense scene, which is more emphasized when the theme of the good, bad, and the ugly plays. Yeah, imagine that. The theme of an R-rated spaghetti western was played in a Disney film. It nonetheless establishes how much Simba has grown and how much time has gone by when Timon and Pumbaa raised him. And it all works. All these moments were both hilarious and a breath of fresh air, and it was nice seeing Simba as a cub again. The jump cuts from Timon's frustration with Cub Simba alone were worth the watch. I kept laughing non-stop whenever Timon dealt with Simba's mischief during the daytime as Jungle Boogie was playing. No, I'm not kidding. That was literally what the song was playing. This was a huge part of what made this movie weird. By the inclusion of Jungle Boogie and The Good, Bad, and The Ugly, the soundtrack took chances at different songs that are thematically out of the ordinary. There was also a spy song played during the romance sabotaging scene, and a generic musical for when Simba reaches his adulthood. Have I looked at anything else? Oh great, I, I got served by Timon and Pumbaa. Wonderful, I, I need a minute here. 
I need a minute here. Where's my coffee? Okay, putting aside all the pop culture references, the soundtrack does contain a few legit musicals, one of which was a karaoke reprisal of Akuta Matata, which is nice to have, especially for the younger audience. I also love that after the attempted sabotage during Can You Feel the Love Tonight, we get to see Timon and Pumbaa's ending lyrics presented at a different angle. It's more fan pandering for sure, but watching Simba and Nala together in the distance was just adorable as it was watching it in the first movie. But for any original songs we have, there's one called That's All I Need, where Timon sings about his motivation. It's a short-lived and generic musical, and its meaning was already beaten over the head on what Timon wants before the song even started. I was just trying to shed a little light on a pathetic existence. All we do is dig so we can hide and hide so we can dig. I want to be where we don't have to dig tunnels and live with our heads stuck in the sand. What's so bad about dreaming of a better home? Granted, I had the same issue with I Just Can't Wait to Be King, but that song was a lot more lively and more explanatory on why Simba was excited to take the throne when he grows up. It was enough for me to forgive it. That's All I Need is an okay track, but forgettable at most. Dig a Tunnel, on the other hand, is a song that is an absolute earworm. It's short, but it's simple and straight to the point. They dig to survive. That's it. Once it plays, however, it never leaves your head. This, to me, is what I find most iconic about this movie. Silly, quick-paced, and a little gospelish by including Hallelujah as a lyric. When you get to your Hallelujah, let's dig. There's one final song to mention that I did say for last, as this is my favorite song in the movie. Lebo M's cover of The Lion Sleeps Tonight. It was played during Timon's struggles raising Simba. I absolutely love this cover so much. I used to listen to it a lot back in my teen years after watching this movie. Everything about it is downright gorgeous, smooth, and just too fitting compared to the many different iterations. Most of this is largely due to how well Lebo M can pull this off at the expense of its origins. Most people recognize the song from the Tokens hit back in 1961, but it was originally a South African a cappella song called Imbube by Solomon Linda in 1939. But not only does this cover dig back to its original roots, it delivers a modern spin that makes the song refreshing and atmospheric. This cover alone, I can't recommend enough. Along with that, I do recommend checking out Solomon's Imbube to get a better grasp of what makes Lebo M's cover work so well in the first place. Finally getting to the last bit of this film, the way it ends is a tad predictable, but it still does its job for Timon. Throughout his journey, he's given metaphorical advice from Rafiki to look beyond what you see. Over the course of the movie, he takes this literally, which resulted in the said uncomfortable scenes I mentioned earlier. While he does find the perfect home he's wanted, his later predicament separates him from Simba and Pumbaa and makes him question himself. Based on Rafiki's advice, this makes him realize that his happiness being Hakuta Matata is more than just a happy home. And that was what he needed to look at, friendship and the fond memories. While he has set aside his selfishness before, realizing what's best for everyone, including Simba's circumstance, is the result of what's more important in life than just what he wants. And as an added bonus, his happy home is shared with the rest of the meerkats. So as a result, this story is coherent enough and the character interactions benefit and develop so well with each other. But in doing so, some moments like the ones I have issues with before are a lot more essential. The massive fart was introduced to be utilized in later scenes that were done better. Timon's breakdown on Rafiki's advice was needed for his realization on what he needed to learn about himself. And the frequent pauses includes a series of Disney mascots coming at the end. That was hilarious. For one thing, beloved, there's something that's needed whether I like it or not. So by this point, you can piece together on what makes this movie split. It all comes together as a solid work of entertainment, but by its own costly ambition. With all sorts of humor and ideas to explore, there are bound to be some errors. With some unusual references that are made, strangeness is bound to unfold. But for all I know, some of you may not have that big of an issue. You may love the film in its entirely, or you may not be as fond of the moments that I liked. The very fact that this movie had a split reputation encourages the possibilities of being more open-minded. Maybe that's something I needed to have, as well as anyone else for that matter. So, after finally going over this film, where do I stand on this? Do I side with the positive feedback that can be taken with a pinch of salt, or do I side with the opinion of calling it inferior? Is it recommended, or can it be skipped? Let me answer that with another question. Considering that this is centered on Timon and Pumbaa, what would you expect? What was I expecting? If you've seen the Timon and Pumbaa series, you would be able to grasp an idea on what you're in for. While I do have my gripes with some moments, it is a humor-driven story. A story that never expected for you to take it as seriously as the first two movies. 
and when it does tend to be genuine, it does the job well without feeling forced or desperate. Even at a time when I first discovered and sat through the movie, I kind of knew what I was getting myself into given the cover art. Looking back on my first impression, it was admittedly exciting at looking at new material and seeing the references of the first movie along with different angles on where the familiar scenes took place. And after finishing it, I was happy with what I watched. But as expected, I always geared myself towards the first movie. As time went on, I pretty much forgot about it until I would start getting myself into reviewing movies. At one point, I was considering giving this a purely negative review. Having the material bash for the amount of times the movie was put at a halt or how insulting Puma's massive fart was in the circle of life. Thankfully, I never fully committed to this phase because after realizing that, I would be encouraging a taboo. A taboo that is entitled and toxic. After stepping away from reviewing movies and latching onto other material, I looked back on this movie once more and thought if I still allegedly hated this movie. After finally sorting out my criticisms, no, I don't hate this movie. Not as much as I remember. While I did have some issues with it, and was admittedly critical in one scene, I still had the same impression as the first time I watched it. In the end, this movie was fun. I liked it more than I did before. It wasn't groundbreaking and epic like the first movie, or dared to take on something that would benefit its lore like the sequel did. But really, that's an unfair argument if you were to compare it to the previous works. Unfortunately, that's bound to happen no matter what. But as is, it's just a silly, harmless edition that just has fun with itself. It's an oddball edition that exists. And you know what? That's okay. It has its own charm for that, and that's what makes it all the merrier. The best way to recommend this movie is definitely for fans of Timon and Pumbaa. Given that they had their own show and their Stand By Me short, I'm more than certain there's a following for them. If you dig these characters, you'll like this movie. If not, but you still like The Lion King like me, view it with a different perspective and try not to take it too seriously as I did. I mean, as much as I wasn't fond of Pumbaa's fart, it's just a scene at the end of the day. It didn't really ruin my experience looking back on the movie anyway. But regardless, The Lion King 1.5 is beloved to watch and it certainly has its place. And I'm more than happy of it being an oddball edition. By providing a sense of variety, I say cheers to that one, Disney. Cheers to that one. From a prequel that dives into the original movie comes a pilot that would take place in the middle of the sequel. But that's another review for another day of Returning to Pride Rock. Until next time, this is Golden Fox, and take care.